I want to introduce our guests. And the way these work, I think Vicky already mentioned, is we, uh, you're also the guest. So we have, we're so happy to have Dr. Sackard, who wants to be called Joe, which is going to be hard for me. And Miss, Miss Lerner, just kidding, Sarah Lerner. I met, they called me Miss in New York City. I'm not sure in Florida. I'm so excited to have our guests. And we also have Dr. Gary Rosenberg, who's going to, he's a psychiatrist. We'll talk a bit about trauma uh, for both how to deal with, help, help young people and yourself <laughs> with trauma. Uh, and then we also have nurse Robin Kogan here, who is going to chime in later as well. But you're all the guests. So when you start writing in your questions, know that if we, I think we have a, well, our group is pretty big, but we hope to get to as many questions as possible. And you might get called on to ask your question. So be ready for that. Uh, but let's get started. So we'll spend the first 20 minutes or so, so talking with Joe and Sarah, and then we'll open up the discussion to everyone else. So let me introduce our guests. So Sarah Lerner is also, which is exciting to me, is in her 19th year of teaching, and it's her seventh at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. She was the tw so 2014, she has so many accomplishments. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to list some of them. <laughs> I can't list them all. There's so many. It's okay. Uh, she was the 2014 Sun, Sun Sentinel High School Journalism Teacher of the Year. She was a 2019 CSPA, that stands for Columbia Scholastic Press Associ Association Gold Key recipient. And she got the 2020 Special Recognition Advisor from CSPA as well of activism against gun violence? Um, well, I was on campus on February 14th, 2018, when a gunman opened fire and killed 17 and injured 17 more people on my campus. So prior to that, um, I've always been socially active and, um, outspoken about causes that I believe in, but gun violence never impacted me directly until that day. And from that day forward, I have, I feel like I've made it my life's work now to work to end gun violence and to work towards common sense gun reform. Thank you. And I know it's a yeah, I really appreciate you being here tonight based on the circumstances of the recent three-year anniversary. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Yeah, well, first of all, um, thanks so much for, for having me tonight. It's really uh, always, uh, I think, not just an honor, but really so much fun to have the chance to interact and have a dialogue with people that, you know, some of you I know uh, and many of you, if not all, have been, you know, tirelessly working on efforts, whether it's gun violence prevention or other, you know, social justice efforts to make this country a better place. And I think all of us um, really kind of have, you know, a story as to why we do the things that we do. And this is no different for me. You know, I initially um, never had the intention, I think, growing up of uh, you know, working within the gun violence prevention space. Uh, and at the age of 17, my life uh, really changed after I was nearly killed uh, when shot in the throat with a 38 caliber bullet. And, you know, I think uh, even though I didn't realize it at that time, um, the worst moment of my life also turned out to be the most impactful because it really inspired me to, you know, figure out how do I give other people the same second chance that I was given? And it's what led me down a path uh, into medicine, uh, led me to become uh, a trauma surgeon, but then also kind of pushed me to really figure out how do you think beyond simply the trauma center? How do you think beyond the operating room in order to really prevent the senseless tragedies that we are seeing. And, you know, of course, um, it's great to be on with Sarah. And, you know, my heart goes out to Sarah and all of, you know, the Parkland community. Uh, but it wasn't just Parkland, it was the entire country that was shook by that senseless tragedy and by the tragedies that we continue to see 
all across this country. And I'm excited to really peel back some of those layers and to have this discussion with all of you because I think it's critical to realize that this is a public health problem that we are facing. And it's not just these random, you know, mass shootings that we often hear about. So thanks again for having me and excited uh, to, to chat. Thank you so much for that. And it is so important to have trauma surgeons on the front lines, making that connection between the data and the personal, which I think we'll get more into later. So Sarah, I have a couple of questions for you and then I'll, we'll go back to Joe. So, you know, I want to acknowledge that Sunday was the third anniversary of the trauma that the Parkland community experienced, the, the, the shooting. I wanted to just ask you how, what it's like, what was like, what was, what was it like for you to be in school leading up to the anniversary, how it's been for you and the students this week as well? Um, so leading up to the anniversary is always different. And the first year, you know, you don't know, you don't know what to expect because you've never gone through something like this before. The second year you're comparing it to the first. And this year it was heavy for me because those students who were freshmen that day are now seniors and they're seniors who I have in my English classes. They're seniors who are editors on my yearbook staff. And um, it, was, it was difficult for me, I guess because in part, I wanted to make sure that they were okay. And I tried to lighten the load on our curriculum. We're reading Macbeth in English and, you know, I got through act one, but I couldn't in good conscience start act two last week because King Duncan dies. And, you know, I told them I was giving them a, a week reprieve from Macbeth. I think they were happy about that. Um, and we did a lot of, um, like not creative writing, but I had them do like reflective writing. Um, and they seemed to enjoy that. And some of them shared out and, you know, you go through, like when you go through something like this together, it's, it's that shared experience, but then you've also gone through it and you're healing sort of in isolation because you don't know who feels the way you feel. And it's not everyone's comfortable talking about it. So you can't just sit and share. So I asked them if they would be okay, my seniors, I asked them if they would be okay if I shared my feelings leading up to the anniversary and they all seemed open to it. So, you know, I'll talk about it with anyone anywhere, but the kids are different. And once I shared, it made them feel like they were in a safer space to do the same. Um, did you ask me about the anniversary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, you're answering the question. I tend to ramble no, well, and I, I lose I my think, train of thought. No, that was that's perfect. And I think it's really, I think that's really crucial. That's a crucial point for teachers to understand, you know, even if we're not dealing with the trauma of, of gun violence, we're all, I'm not in school now, I'm remote, but there's a lot of trauma going on around the pandemic. Many of my students have lost family members. They themselves mm -hmm. have COVID and survived it, luckily. And I think it's important, great advice that you just gave, which is sometimes it's helpful for us to open up and share. And then it makes them like model that. And then it makes students feel more comfortable being vulnerable with their own feelings around the trauma, which is actually does, works perfectly with my next question, which I, I think it does. Uh, what inspired you to, to, to write your, get your book written? It's a collaborative effort with the students. So when did you come up with the idea? Was it something that kind of came to you or was it a gradual process? Um, it wasn't my idea at all, actually. Oh. I was approached by the senior editor at Random House um, and she asked if I would be interested in working on an anthology the title had yet to be determined, but you know, compiling student uh, writing and poetry and artwork and photos and kind of 
make it into these like small digestible pieces of what our collective and individual experiences were. So that call came, I wanna say like March or April of 2018. And from that point until the end of the school year, I was soliciting work from my students, um, my English seniors, my journalism classes, students on my yearbook staff. And then I also reached out to students who were in the creative writing classes. And I worked on it all summer and I got like an advanced copy of the book in October. And like, I make a yearbook every year. So like I have clearly made books and I see my name in print, but it's totally different when your name is on the cover and there's that like, oh my God, this is gonna be an every bookstore feeling like, yeah. But it was just, it was an amazing experience and it really helped me move through my own healing process because I was able to fill in some of the gaps in what happened that day based on where I was. There were just, I mean, a million things that I didn't know. Um, and it, it gave me a, broader perspective of what my students had gone through. And it was just tremendous. Can you read a, a short excerpt from the book? Is that sure. on the spot? There's no, not at all. From, but I, preview. I, I'm going to read from the first one because the pages in the book aren't numbered and I have no idea where the other one is. So I'll just read from this first one. So um, this is called rewrite and this is the piece that opens up the book. I've always been a writer. I love the feel of the keys under my fingers, clicking as the words appear on the screen. I love the whole process, creation, editing, revising, lather, rinse, repeat. For some, writing serves as a way to share who they really are, a way to be creative, open, fearless, honest, a way to say what they want without having to vocalize it. After tragedy strikes, people respond differently. Some take pictures, some find food, some exercise, some retreat, some write. Watching my students find their voices after someone tried to silence them was impressive. Perhaps that's an understatement. It was awe-inspiring. It was brave, it was courageous. They turned their grief into words, into pictures, into something that helped them begin the healing process. They created something that will be kept for the rest of their lives, a yearbook. This year is so much more, I'm sorry, this yearbook is so much more than just a book. It's memories, it's stories, it's pictures, it's smiles, it's heartache, it's real. The theme for the yearbook was as one, which we selected in April, 2017. I couldn't think of anything more fitting for what the year became. We struggled as one, we loved as one, we cried as one, we mourned as one. I will always be a writer. I will always love to read other people's writing. I will always be inspired by the process through which people write. In working on Parkland Speaks, I was able to further my passion for writing through the editing process. I read pieces from my students as well as students who aren't mine. It's raw, it's real, it happened to them. I'm thankful, for, I'm thankful for the opportunity to participate in this project. I'm thankful to be able to use my voice. I'm thankful that I work with students who aren't afraid to use theirs. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, and for everyone who has not had the honor of reading the book, I highly, highly recommend it. And we'll talk to you a little bit about that later. Uh, so, um, we'll come back to you again, Sarah. I have some more questions for you, but I wanted to, sorry for that noise. I wanted, <laughs> New York City. Uh, I wanted to ask Joe some questions. So I can't, it's so hard for me not to call you a doctor, but J Joe, uh, as, so you're both, as you shared with us, you're both a survivor of gun violence and as we all know, a trauma surgeon. So I wanted to, I wanna ask you about how you, I think you already kind of answered this, what led you to getting into emergency medicine? But my first question for you is, you know, you've been you've been following the issue of gun violence in America for a long time now. And my first question is, what's changed and not changed around gun violence in your career so far? 
Yeah, I mean, it, look, it's it's such a great question because I, I think about, you know, when I had my own incident, I was a senior in high school and we're talking about here, this was like September 1994. And I want to say that, you know, this was, of course, before social media, I might have been like two lines on the back of like the Washington Post, right? And there was no even like thought about hey, should we be discussing, you know, this issue that clearly is taking the lives of, you know, thousands of Americans every year. And that wasn't the case at that time. So as you think about, you know, where we were, you know, especially like kind of personally, and I think about what's happened over time, I think a lot of it had, a lot of the change that we've seen has had to do with the media attention that has come to a number of these very, I think, high profile mass shootings, understandably so. And I wanna say that, you know, look, there, no, like, you know, uh, what, no one mass shooting uh, is, I think, more significant than the other, right? They're all just horrible and they're senseless tragedies. But what I recall happening in 2011 and 2012 when I was in fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania is that was right when Sandy Hook happened. And when Sandy Hook happened, I feel that America started to really kind of start to pay attention to this issue. Now, clearly we know that like when we look at this issue at the federal level, right, there's still so many things that we have to do. And so many of us that work on this issue day in and day out are so frustrated. But I think it's important to also look at the positive aspects of how far we have come. Because we have to recognize that in America, most governing actually doesn't happen at the federal level. It happens at the local and the state level. And you look at what happened in 2018, where there were 67 pieces of legislation around gun reform that was passed in states all across this country. And so when you think about, well, why did that happen? Well, it happened because of people like all of you on this call, you know, whether it's, you know, Nurse Robin that is like just so fearless and out there every day, or whether it's those moms that are showing up in their red shirts to, you know, state houses, or whether it's the healthcare workers, and it's not just the doctors, it's the nurses, the techs, the researchers, the people that are now willing to sit on the sidelines of history as people continue to be slaughtered in cities across America. So I think a lot has changed. And I think, you know, social media has been a big piece of, of that change. And I think we also, as, as Americans, um, have started to hold our elected officials accountable. I mean, you think about in 2008, I think there was somewhere like 63 or so democratically elected members of Congress that had an A rating for the NRA. And when you look at that in 2018, I think the number was somewhere around three. I haven't looked at the recent numbers, but the point is, is that times are changing and, and we are starting to hold our officials accountable. And that's what's gonna be so critical to I think continuing to move this needle forward. So sorry for that kind of you know verbose answer, but I, I just think it's a very complex issue and you have to look at it from a multifaceted perspective. No, and that's a part, your answer was not verbose at all. It was perfect. And I, it, you illuminated a lot uh, about, I, I agree in terms of just the social media aspect has helped a lot uh, and push the needle in the, what I think about is a better direction for our country. And I also hope that with the new administration, we can actually get some common sense gun laws passed. And you bring up the fact that it is a complex issue. And I wanted to dig a little deeper into that topic with you. You make it, because you're, you're a trauma surgeon in Baltimore, you always make it a point to not just focus on school shootings, because I want to hear more from you about the importance of not just focusing on school shoot, shootings when we talk about gun violence and it, why it's important to think about the BIPOC community that is impacted by 
gun violence as well. So why why do you make that so such a big part of your activism? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a big part of, of um, what I try to talk about because of a few things. The first is when you look at, I don't want to just specifically, uh, you know, use the term school shootings, I'll just say mass shootings, right? So typically a lot of people define that as four or more people injured or killed, right? When you look at those mass shootings, they comprise less than 2% of the overall, you know, injuries and deaths that we're seeing. And that's critical because, you know, what that tells us is that every day in communities across America, people are being injured and killed. And as you think about the brown and black community, we know that black Americans are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. The, they experience nearly 10 times the gun homicides, 15 times the gun assaults, and three times the fatal police shootings of white Americans. So those numbers to me are just absolutely horrific. The disparity is tremendous. And I think that we have, you know, sorry, both the opportunity and the responsibility to ensure that their stories are told. Um, we are facing a public health problem. And I think that we need to start really looking at this issue from that lens. And once we start looking at this issue from a public health perspective, we then start to realize that the complexity of those type of disease processes require a multidisciplinary, multifaceted approach that allows us to tackle and tailor interventions specific to you know, the type of you know, gun violence that we're seeing, whether it's suicides or you know, urban homicides, et cetera. So that's why all of this is important. Of course, I'm in East Baltimore where you know, we're facing this you know, day in and day out. Thank you so much for all of that and all that information. It's important to keep in mind. And you actually uh, mentioned Robin Kogan, who's on the call with us tonight. And I think if I quote you correctly, a fearless activist when it comes to gun control. So I just wanted to bring Robin into the conversation. Some of you might know her from other Zooms. She is a, nur a school nurse in Camden, New Jersey. And her website is, I believe, relentless, relentlessnurse.com. Relentless School Nurse. Right? School Nurse. Okay, good. RelentlessSchoolNurse.com. Tell us what got you into gun um, control, gun violence activism. So, you know, in the in the um, the theme of all this world is very small. I just have to say that several people on this call are part of how describe why this world is very small. So, I'll tell you that my story is I, I look at gun violence from a very personal family level perspective of generational trauma and also from the professional lens of a school nurse who works in an urban district where community gun violence is very frequent. So as a, um, from my family history, uh, unbelievably um, in the same city where I work now, my father as a 12 year old boy uh, was part of the very first mass shooting in America where 13 people were killed, including his mother, his father, and his grandmother. Um, he was left an orphan. Uh, 10 others were also killed that day in a very small neighborhood in Camden, New Jersey, where I am currently and have been for 20 years a school nurse. Um, but fast forward 70 years, and my niece was a Parkland student. In fact, Sarah Lerner was her teacher. Um, Sarah had my niece Carly in, I think, her freshman and sophomore year. And then senior year, Sarah accompanied um, students on a trip to New York after the shooting. So for, for me, the generational trauma of, of the impact of gun violence is, is how I became an activist, certainly after what happened with Carly. Um, and incredibly enough, both my father, who survived this horrendous thing when he was 12, and Carly, both hid in a closet from the, the murderers. Both situations were common in that, and this is very common with, with mass murders too, is that you know in both situations, it was uh, someone who knew their victims. It was somebody who had uh, thoughts of revenge. And the final thing is had access to weapons. 
So 70 years between these two events, and there were so many connections. Um, I also, I met Joe Saccharin through Twitter, through my, my work in gun violence prevention. And I have been um, such an admirer of his work, his voice, his passion, um, and, and everything he does to bring this issue to light. And uh, Joe's a very humble person, but he's also an incredible when it comes to policy. He is a policy wonk who just finished, right? A Robert Wood Johnson Policy Fellowship in Washington, DC. Uh, I mean, this is a, a man who is like living his purpose every single day. So, um, so that's my, that's where I come from. Um, and I mean, I, as a school nurse in a city that deals with community gun violence, I have to say what you brought up about, you know, these big events like Parkland and, and, and Sandy Hook and Columbine, um, the, the community gun violence, as we know, doesn't get the same attention. It doesn't get the same, you know, headlines and people on CNN night after night. But yet every single day it's happening in cities across this country. And I have to say for all of um, everyone on this call who's a teacher or a parent or a school staff, from, from Parkland until now, almost 206, I'm sorry, not Parkland, from Columbine until now, almost 260,000 students have been impacted by gun violence just in school alone. Either they're part of a school where gun violence happened, yes. So just think about those numbers. Um, so anyway, that's yeah, that's, that's my that is my experience. That's the numbers are staggering, and there's so many questions. I just put in the chat to put your questions in again, but I'm seeing a lot of questions that are I've and questions that I've been having too related to the impact of this pandemic on student mental health, and we all know that 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 you know, relates to, to gun violence, whether it's suicides or mass shootings in some form or just drive-by shootings. Um, so I guess one question, I guess, Amanda, you, I wanted to bring Amanda into the conversation. I think you had a question. Uh, I don't, I didn't ask a question, I don't think. Never mind. Um, I thought you did. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. So Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, you wanted to talk about, I have, you have a question about urban community violence uh, versus suburban shootings. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so you see it. I mean, I'm just um, incredibly amazed by, not in a good way, but about how prevalent gun ownership is in this community that I teach in. I mean, I can't get over how common it is among teachers and families. And I'm wondering, we're all, you know, uh, urban communities, yes, there's gun violence there, but are there numbers to support more a rise in gun ownership in the suburbs? Because I feel like it's so common now. Uh, Joe, do you want to take that one? So are, are you asking, are we seeing a rise in in the homicide rate? Is that what you're- Right, asking? in the homicide rate, rate in, in gun, or do more people in the suburbs own guns and as a result there's a rise in um, homicide rates or accidental shooting rates or or um, are we seeing because in my experience I, I can't get over even just as a teacher I have a student this on my caseload this semester whose mother was shot and killed in a fast food parking lot over a stupid argument this kid's nine and he saw his mom gunned down and this is in the suburbs. So I'm, I'm like, and there are other stories like that, but I'm thinking, is this just a very weird suburb? But I don't, I don't know. So it, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Let me just say one thing about like the current past year, because I think all of this is kind of related. And so he's brought this up uh, a few times. Look, there has been like enormous increases in gun sales and when you look at that, right, and that's combined with like economic distress, it's combined with 
isolation, which I'm sure Dr. Rosenberg can talk about and how that impacts you know, mental health, but all of this due to COVID-19. And that has intensified okay. the country's gun violence crisis. We're really, in my mind, you know, facing these, what I call like dueling public health crises, right? And work, when you look at you know, urban gun violence versus suburban gun violence, the access to the firearm continues to be one of the biggest factors. And what right. right now we have actually just, like literally this data just came out yesterday. We've been working on this um, study with our office of the medical examiner in Maryland to look at what's happened over the past 15 years. And I think to your point, Jennifer, we are seeing that the intensity of violence has actually appears to have increased over the past decade and a half. And it doesn't appear to protect the suburban community as folks may have thought in the past and as you're alluding to. Now, this is still early on and we're still kind of bringing together all this data, but at least from a preliminary perspective, when we've looked at it, it sounds like, it looks like, you know, there is just as much senseless tragedy that's happening, both in suburban communities as well as mm-hmm. urban communities. Now, it's important to recognize that you will often see different types of prevalence that exist. We know, for example, you know, suicide in rural communities, right? We see that quite a bit. Unintentional injuries, which by the way, I always use the word unintentional versus accident because accident implies it's not preventable. So from a public health perspective, you know, just something for all of us mm-hmm. in the back of our minds. So there is that, that difference as you look at the different pieces of gun violence, whether it's suicide, unintentional injury, or, you know, the urban uh, violence that we're seeing. And it's important to break those out because all of those will require different types of interventions that allow us to tailor them specifically um, to the community of interest. Thank you so much for that information. Really helpful. Um, your, that, that discussion brought up a lot of issues related to mental health and gun violence. So Malaya, I think, am I saying your name right? Malaya, right? Malia, just like Malia. my daughter. <laughs> Malia, I know we had this conversation last time. And with my name, which is Sari, but everyone says, sorry, I'm specific, I'm particularly uh, cognizant of pronunciations. I appreciate it. Yeah, so um, I'd love for you to uh, bring, to ask your question related to mental health and gun violence. Yeah, so I was a student at a high school that in um, Seattle, Washington, where there was a shooting. Um, and, and thankfully, no one lost their life, individuals. Um, so that, that was, um, you know, a very, of course, scary time. And that was over two decades ago. And so I appreciate, Robin, how you were sharing about how your father experienced, you know, gun violence. Um, and how it has continued 70 years later and it has continued to impact your family. And so Joe, I really wanna highlight the point that you brought up about um, the need for working at the state level for policy. One of the areas that I believe needs to be um, focused on a little bit more or a lot more is screening measures, right? Where, and, and how do we write policy to incorporate these screening measures? So for example, I was teaching in West Oakland for a school for 200 students who failed eighth grade. And um, at the end of the year, the counselor and I sat down at a restaurant and and said, we can't do this again. We have to change what we're doing because we were always just trying to put our fingers in in the holes, right? But we needed to be more proactive. So we created two screening measures. It's about 20 years ago for social emotional health where kids could request anger management, where students could request drug and alcohol counseling, where parents could request those services as well for their children at orientation before school started, because being in the classroom and having a student tell you, Ms. Hall, the student is suicidal and they're at home and I'm having to manage the class and call the office and call the ambulance, you know what I mean? It's, you know, is there any, we, we need to do better at getting ahead of um, 
students in crisis and families in crisis. So I'm just curious to know from this beautiful community, are there models that you have seen in terms of stronger screening measures, um, in terms of supporting those students, finding those students who have experienced violence in their life? I would, I would love to um, learn more about what you know about that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss it to Dr. Rosenberg, who is a child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist. And um, what, you know, in terms of what we were, yeah, I'd love to hear your input on that for just what teachers should be looking for, what school systems should be doing differently to identify kids before they get themselves in violent situations with guns. Well, thanks for uh, including me in the discussion. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I'm a faculty at uh, New Jersey Rutgers Medical School, New Jersey uh, Newark Medical School, and uh, have been involved in uh, all levels of care and treatment for the last uh, 30 some years, uh, from inpatient to outpatient to day programming. When I first started, the average length of stay inpatient was three months, believe it or not. Now it's probably three days. So to answer the question would take me probably a series of lectures an hour each of about 10 lectures over the next two and a half months. So in the five minutes that I have, I'm gonna recommend some reading for you to do. The first thing I think you should do is connect yourselves with the national, um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, NCTSN, the best site going. You can get on their daily email list and you'll be introduced to lots of discussions and articles and writings having to do with what we're talking about, trauma in schools. So it's NCTSN, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. It's wonderful. The other thing that you should try to do is get your hands on a copy of the book entitled Psychological First Aid for Schools. It's great. Um, about 50 odd, or more than that, 90 pages, 100 pages of wonderful um, guidelines for addressing the stress of working in schools, the stress of being a student in schools, and in particular, uh, focusing on plans and approaches to helping not only students, but teachers, administrative staff, support staff, custodial staff, um, in uh, working in schools where there's considerable amount of stress, particularly after a death for whatever reason. Now you have to remember really the first mass um, destructive behavior in schools took place in Bath, Michigan in 1927, when a student there killed 38 other students and six staff. It's not written about very much, it's not known about, but uh, it's the first time, it's interesting to read about it, not much different than today in terms of the sources behind that behavior. It's just gotten more intense and there are more people with psycho psychological, psychiatric problems now, particularly in adolescents. Suicide rates have gone up, depression, anxiety. The other issue um, really is then the impact of behavior like this on students who are in a school, who experience um, shootings in their school and how that impacts every student in the school to some degree, impacts the staff to some degree, impacts the community. And so therefore the response like in Parkland is to develop a comprehensive approach to dealing with the issues. It's not just school. And I don't know when teachers are gonna find the time to do psychological counseling and assess the psychological state of their students unless you're in a special ed school. So um, right now, the way things are structured, um, it really takes a community effort to address the issues of stress in the daily life of students and what player place uh, to, to begin to address that would be in a school and after school programs and the like. So, you know, after a school shooting, let me just say, 
the most common response by everybody in the school and in the community is one of denial, shock, and disbelief. People can't believe this happened in their school, right? Shortly followed by fear, anger, anxiety, inattention, depression, poor sleep, all the psychological, emotional responses that one experiences when you go through this. And this impacts not just the students, but it's the staff as well. Now right. the staff jump into this full speed ahead because that's their job. And they don't really pay as much attention to themselves as they probably need to. <clears throat> that's important, yeah. And so let's remember that the staff also needs some kind of support and also needs help the same way that the students do. And then finally we reach the final phase, which is you know several weeks later after all this, when you're left with people experiencing almost PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder-like symptoms, um, having flashbacks, trouble sleeping, anxiety. Some begin to self-mutilate, some begin to use drugs. Some people experience suicidal behavior in response to this event several weeks later. And these are the children, <clears throat> and sometimes the adults too, who have experienced uh, emotional, social, behavioral difficulties prior to this event. So it's just an add-on. And right. now within the construct of COVID, um, let's look what happened at the Capitol. Right. Beginning right. of January. There were There's suicidal deaths after that event in the police. Yeah. That's, so yeah. what I'm trying to say is this is a complicated, I'm going to finish in a second, of a situation that involves multiple levels of understanding and multiple levels of treatment but done in the right way, it brings people together in a positive way and provides a healthy outlook and a healthy future for that school, for those students, for the teachers and for the community. Thank you so much for all that information. We're compiling it and other people are chiming in with resources as well. And I, and I think it's really important the way you framed it at the end that the goal of this is to create a positive and healthy community and to really start thinking about you know, we say the school community all the time, but I think during COVID, and I'm sure for in school environments where there were unfortunately there was unfortunately violence, gun violence, you start realizing what community means more. Um, so thank you for all that information. I wanted to go back to Joe and and talk a little more, get a little more into gun policy, and I want to hear more about your activism and and ways that we can get our school communities involved in uh, gun control activism, especially in terms of, I wanna hear more about your movement, this is our lane, hashtag, this is our lane. Yeah, thanks. So uh, just kind of briefly, let me just first say that, um, you know, th the whole this is our lane movement is really, you know, not me. Yes, I founded the, the Twitter handle, but it really is a compilation of so many individuals. And again, you know, not to like keep picking up on Robin, but Robin and I see Dr. Bernard is also on the line and so many other individuals within healthcare that when they heard the NRA essentially say that doctors or healthcare workers had no role in coming up with solutions as it relates to gun violence prevention, um, we were frankly incensed. And I think for any one organization or, you know, one, you know, kind of group of individuals to think that they can solve their problem, this problem uh, on their own, either they don't understand the complexity of the problem or they're not very serious about moving the needle forward. And so all of us as, you know, healthcare workers and clinicians came together and said, listen, you know, um, we have to tell the story of what we're seeing day in and day out. We have to show the pictures to folks. So Americans understand that what we are facing is happening in cities and hospitals all across America. And I think, you know, as it relates to your question about like educators, right? And, you know, schools and maybe even other professions. I think one of the reasons that this resonated so much is because we didn't come out there and say, hey, you know, 40,000 people die a year of gun violence. No, like the data is important. The data is critical, right? And as a scientist, a researcher, of course, I love the data, but the data does not change the hearts and minds of people. And so if you want to go from value to action, right? And value is the purpose, it's the why. 
You have to do it by being able to tell your story. And what I would say to all of these incredible people is I would challenge you and say, like, what is your story? Like, really think about that. Like, why are you doing the things that you do? And figure out a way to tell it because that's what resonates whether you're on the Hill talking to elected officials or you're in your own community trying to get people to understand and to believe in what you believe in. And I think if you can do that, then you combine that with the data and then you're incredibly effective. And so again, I, I'm just so grateful to be around so many people that I've learned from and really part of a collective group that has allowed us together to rise up uh, and, and really kind of make a difference in this area. Thank you so much. And I will say that, you know, I've been teaching for 19 years and the March for Our Lives movement, that and the environmental movement, because I work at an environmental high school, I, I saw my students going to protest for the first time and really galvanized by the Parkland students. It was, it was powerful. It almost makes me cry because I saw my students feel so empowered by your students, Sarah. And so I wanted to just ask you about what it was like, what it, what it was like seeing the students come together like that and start this movement that impacted my students down on 56th and 9th Street and students around the world. It was awesome. And I, it just sounds so trite when I say that, but it really, really was like the kids and they're not kids anymore, but the kids everyone saw three years ago are the kids that we've always known and we've always had. Like I had Emma when she was a junior, she was in my journalism class and the Emma, you know, is the Emma I've always known. Like these kids don't turn it on and turn it off when they're in the spotlight. Like this is who they are. And to see them, to see them take something so traumatic that like happened at their school, happened to their friends and instantly put their heads together and turn it into a movement and not just a temporary movement, like a movement was un unbelievable and the strength that they have and I don't know how uh, colorful I get with my language here but the strength that they have and like just the balls that they have to be able to do this and go up against politicians and the NRA and like not care uh, you know about anything except their mission and their passion is inspiring like there are adults who don't stand up for what they believe in and these kids were 16 17 18 years old and I was in DC for the march and I mean you could just feel it in the air the power that was happening in DC that day and I have been inspired by them for the last three years. I will continue to be inspired by them. I think we all should be inspired by what they're doing and take, take their action and make it our own action. You know, they stepped in where adults have failed them. So where we as adults were inactive, they have become like overactive and we need to do more to, to be like them. I agree. And I, I'm a broken record with this. We all, we all know what records are. <laughs> the kids don't. I can't they use don't, but we do. I can use that phrase with us. I am always saying that it needs to be intergenerational, right? March for Our Lives was inspiring and powerful and you know, a bunch of teachers in the group just were saying, yeah, it inspired my kids in California too, but it needs to be intergenerational. And I noticed that they were talking about their teachers a lot of times when they were giving their speeches and, and talking to the media about what they learned at APGov, how they learned to write in journalism class with you. So we, we are working with them kind of behind the scenes, but I think they challenged us to get out there in the streets and be vocal about it too. So I, I agree with I you. Think I mean, if I can jump in for just a moment, I think that adults 
oftentimes are very quick to dismiss teenagers, that they don't know what they're talking about. They're always on their phones, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, guess what? These kids started that movement via Twitter on their phones. And they know more than we think they know. And they probably know more than we want to admit they know. So it drives me insane that adults are so quick to dismiss teenagers. Like they're on their phones, but they started a movement. So listen to them. I agree. And I think that there was all this talk about, you know, Right. I feel like up until March for Our Lives, it was a turning point where everyone, all the older people used to, you know, yell at kids for being on their, their phones all the time. And now, <laughs> look, they, they were teaching educators how to conduct remote learning because, well, they were on their, their devices all the time. So they were showing us a thing or two. So I think it's, I, I agree. I'm always, always an advocate for listening to our, to our young people. Uh, Sid, I wanted to bring you into the discussion because uh, Vicky said that you're the epitome of intergenerational activism. Uh-huh. And, and she was saying that you, you had mentioned how powerful March for Our Lives was in your life. I wanted well, to bring you in. Two things. Um, one, I keep seeing in the chat, very wonderful teacher saying, what can I do? And I have put in there, Um, We had in our 18 high school district training by FEMA. It's free. Uh, The only thing it's free to us, but remember it costs tax money, which we may get more of for education in something called threat assessment. It's very, very good for a lot of things. You know that everybody from the beginnings of all of these, you know, school shootings, Columbine, Dylan did. There's something called leakage. Uh, You look for it when you're trained as in threat assessment, you gather together the teachers, uh, the nurse, uh, a lot of the people that know somebody that seems troubled. Now, this may not always be about guns, but it can be. And we truly believe we may have saved at least one in our district um, uh, of a kid who had a gun and was terribly upset. So this is something you can do. Ask for FEMA threat assessment training in your district and your school. It doesn't take much time. You'd only do it if you see some of this leakage. And English teachers, if you're there, that's who sees it the most. In in journals, in writing, Shari knows. That's where you really get to the hearts and minds of kids. As far as what we can do to help create the kind of active citizenship we saw in the Parkland kids is we have to teach civics and government in a different way. We just can't say this is how a bill is passed. We have to activate what happened to those kids, what happened to Emma Gonzalez or David Hogg in their civics class, in their drama class, um, in their journalism class that let them feel that they had the power to change. And we can do that. We can work very hard to change the way we teach so that kids become agents. We, we teach agency. But do remember threat assessment. Thank you for that information. And I, I agree, you know, definitely in English classes, you can learn a lot about where students are coming from. I have a, I, I run a club at my school, a feminist club, and that's also where a lot of concerns that students are dealing with personally and other kind of community concerns come up. So I always bring in the school social worker there. So yeah, there, we need to keep your ears and eyes open, you know, all the time. Uh, I wanted to, there's, okay, so it's 7.59 right now. There's, there's a final, okay, let's go with Greg's. Greg has a really good question. It's an all caps, good question. So it's a good question. Uh, and it and it has to go back, to, it goes back to policy, which I think is really important. Can you ask it really quickly because we're, we're, we're getting towards book giveaway time and then final thoughts from our guests. But Greg, can you just jump in with your question and then we will start giving away books? Yeah, actually, I have to, full disclosure, I have to give credit to Kent Willman, who's also oh. on the call here. He asked this question, uh, but it's, you know, it, it's basically what can we do with gun owners? How can we converse? How can we talk with gun owners? Um, Who 
I think if you look back at their past, especially with the earlier works of NRA, uh, had a concern about gun violence. And how can we, the question is, how can we talk with them? How can we converse with them so that they just don't dismiss our message and uh, the concerns we have? Because there is a real wall right now. Joe, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Greg, I think that's a, such a fantastic question. And I think th there's a couple things. So first of all, and I saw Robin kind of started to allude to this, I think as Americans in general, we have a lot more in common than we have that divides us. And I think sometimes we don't see that because we don't take enough time to actually listen to other individuals. When I go to places like Kansas and Oklahoma even, right, gun owners will come up to me and say, hey, Joe, you know what? Like, I actually agree with the majority of what you're saying. And it was very enlightening because that actually shows that, you know what, there are these commonalities that can bridge us together. When you look at an organization like the NRA, I think actually the problem are not the gun owners. It's that the leadership of the NRA actually doesn't represent the membership. And I, I actually think that gun owners are starting to realize that and trying to figure out different ways to kind of escape from, you know, these policies that don't really reflect responsible gun ownership that they believe in. And from a healthcare perspective, I can tell you, you know, we've been working on trying to develop, um, you know, toolkits to empower clinicians with both the knowledge and kind of the comfort level to discuss, you know, aspects like safe storage in a way that's objective, that's non-judgmental, and that's simply made to ensure that people are being safe and responsible. So I think it's a spot on question. I think we gun owners are part of the solution. And I think we owe it upon you know, ourselves to ensure that they're not excluded you know, in this very kind of you know, divided and hyper-partisan society that we're currently living in. So, so important. I think we're all ready to find ways to work together to make this world a safer place. So I like to believe that after all these years, I still believe that. I just wanna thank everyone for being here and doing your part to, you know, continue working on this movement and this moment and for letting me talk about my story and talk about my kids and the book and it's it's important and it's important to listen to the survivor story so that we can stop this from continuing to happen thank you and thank you for all of your work through all of this which has been i'm sure very challenging for you just personally and joe yeah well look uh, i just want to thank everyone for you know, spending an hour of their life uh, tonight with us. Um, I always, uh, uh, you know, get a lot of from the conversations and I think the questions are really great. And I, I would just say that, you know, each and every one of us um, have the ability to, to make a difference. And maybe you came on tonight, you know, not necessarily passionate about gun violence prevention, but wanted to learn more about it and that's fine. But whatever you are passionate about, I think, it's just important to remember that we are those change agents that are so necessary to really be out there and have the moral courage to speak up when we see things that are happening that is not in the best interest of our communities or society. And I think that, you know, sometimes we're so busy that it's easy to kind of just say, oh, and just kind of, you know, continue with our daily lives. But I get my energy and my passion, not just from my own experience, but from the patients that I have to take care of day in and day out. And there's nothing, you know, as much as I love what I do, there's nothing worse than having to talk to the mothers and the fathers and, you know, tell them that their child that left that morning is never coming home again. And it's because of, you know, these individuals that really kind of, um, restore my faith in humanity and get me to wake up every morning to try and do everything I can to make this world a better place. And I just hope that, you know, whatever you're passionate about and whatever you're, you're hoping to change, that you can be part of that change and just, you know, be committed to it. And, and thanks for being here tonight.
Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all of you for the work you do. And you're right, what, you know, some people might have joined tonight, not particularly passionate about gun violence, definitely something they want to prevent. But I agree, we are all role models to young people, whether we're teachers or doctors or nurses or their parents. <laughs> and that that's what that's what's inspired me for the past 19 years. Yeah, I'm a US history teacher. And I love American history. I nerd out about it at every hour of the day if I could. But what kept me teaching was working with young people and just being inspired by them and and it making me want to be a better person in this world and lead by example. So, and I'm inspired by all of you too. So thank you so much for, for joining tonight and bearing with my like a little fuzzy vaccine head. <laughs> but uh, I will say the second dose is not, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be for me personally. So some good news. Uh, so thank you so much to, to everyone and to our guests, Joe and Sarah, and to Dr. Rosenberg and Robin and everyone in this room. And of course, to Vicki and NewsHour Extra.